in your lifetimes, you are likely to experience a level of population growth that will have an impact on your cities that is either going to be the kind of dystopic urban future that we see in so, so often in the movies, or quite possibly your cities can thrive and become the kinds of cities that we all want to live in. I get to travel a tremendous amount, and as I travel around the world, I spend, uh, I, I think I've flown four, four million miles in the last 20 years. A lot of that travel is to developing countries. And in those developing countries, I get to meet people who are tremendously excited and hopeful. They believe that their lives are getting better and that their lives of their children will be even better than theirs. It may be antithetical, but the fact is, is that I see more tangible ev evidence that the American dream is alive and well outside of the, these, this country than I do inside this country. When I come back here, I don't see that same kind of passion and hope and expectation that I see in the developing world. They're, they're hungry and they're willing to work to make their future better. Today, we are in the 21st century and it is truly the age of cities. Cities are more central to policy, to culture, to art, to science, to technology, to innovation, more central to our lives and our lifestyles than they've ever been before. If you look at the urban population, it's not the fact that we're seeing urbanization and people are moving to cities that is exciting. What is monumental is the magnitude of the change that we're experiencing. If you think back to the very beginning of cities, 3000 BC in Mesopotamia, it took uh, 5,000 5, years to get to 3 billion people in our cities. And in the next 50 years, or actually from 2000 to 2050, we will see the urban population double. So from 2000 to 2050, we'll see an urban population that is the size of almost 10 populations of America. The US population is about 310 million people. So 10 times that population will be coming to our cities in 1% of the time it took to build the capacity to house the first 3 billion people. For 600 months, we will see a city the size of San Francisco and LA combined be built and occupied. We've never seen cities grow at this rate or this scale before. And the question is, what is that gonna do to our cities? Are we gonna have the kind of cities that we wanna live in, or are we gonna have a dystopic future that we don't want to see? This is an image of a development in Kowloon, an uncontrolled development that is a kind of extreme example we see in slums all over the world. It houses 50,000 people in six and a half acres. That's, if you took the campus of Occidental, which is 100, Occidental College, which is 120 acres, this campus at this density would house almost a million people. That's the kind of density that we might be dealing with in the next 50 years. And when we're not densifying, we're sprawling. We're spreading out across the landscape and eating up our most valuable agricultural land and public space. If we don't want to have these two extremes, we're going to need to come up with new solutions to old problems. We're going to need to reimagine what's possible and change our paradigms. I want to show you three projects that have ideas that I think can be clues for you to reimagine your own cities. First project is in Shanghai. This is Shanghai. It's one of the largest and most exciting cities in the world. In the last 25 years, the population has doubled to almost 24 million people. That's more than half the size of California. It's twice the size of LA metropolitan area and the 35 or 40 cities in, in, in LA. It's 10 times as dense as Los Angeles. Everything you see below the river was farmland in 1990. And today there are 5 million people living on that. At the center of it is three super tall towers, the Lu Zhaozui Financial District. The center tower is the Jin Mao Tower. It's, not, it's 88 stories. The tower on the right is the World Trade Center. 
it's 101 stories, and the tower on the left is our tower, the Shanghai Tower. The Shanghai Tower is under construction right now. It topped off last year, and it'll be occupied uh, by the beginning of 2015, so next year. What's most interesting about the tower is not that it'll be the second tallest building in the world, 121 stories, 6 million square feet. It's not that it's going to be the, the most sustainable super tall tower that's ever been designed. What's most exciting about this is that it's designed as a vertical city. A city made up of nine neighborhoods stacked on top of one another instead of sprawled across the land. Each neighborhood is made up of 14 floors with a 12-story atrium between the inner and outer skin of the building, forming three sky gardens on every amenity floor. That amenity floor, you can see an image on the right, provides retail, conferencing, meeting spaces, places for people to go and see the outdoors. This is a new paradigm in vertical living, giving access to the public realm in a way that we've never seen at this scale before. It'll house almost 20,000 people a day, every day, and be a new paradigm that can change the way we live vertically. In another one of the world's great cities, London, our office there took on a completely different aspect of the public realm. The ground plane and the public space that we find on the ground plane. As our cities get more densely populated and our public space starts to get encroached and reduced, the amount of public space per person is actually plummeting. So they said, let's study how we can enhance and create public space in our cities. This is the Thames River, one of the great assets of, the, of London. And uh, you can see on the right hand side is the South Bank. The South Bank over the last hundred years has been developed into a wonderful pedestrian friendly retail and entertainment district. It actually allows you to walk for miles along the waterfront. But on the north side, you don't get that kind of access. While there are points of access, there's no way to walk along the waterfront. And so our office there imagined a river park that would allow you to navigate the entire North Bank in the way you can on the South Bank and give people, millions of people, access to the North Bank of the river. We developed a design and we submitted it in the London Property Awards. And that project won the top award from the mayor of London, Boris Johnson. Boris has become a, uh, an advocate a super advocate for this project and has tried to help us find a way to make it real. We even developed a business model for the project that would allow it to be built without having any burden on the taxpayers. We found a developer who was willing to build it in return for the ability to rent out a series of pavilions along the park. Even with this compelling idea and the political support from the mayor and no burden to the taxpayers, there are still plenty of entrenched interest groups that are trying to fight it. So we're working hard with the mayor's support to build constituencies that can move this project forward. This last project I want to talk to you about is a broader program that we've set up in our firm. Every office in our firm is committed to community outreach and engagement. And we all are active in pro bono work and charity, charitable work. But the history of our firm is that each office independently chooses what they want to be involved in. So we came up with the idea that what if we had every office working on one problem and we could capture the power of 4,000 people in 46 offices in 16 countries working on a single problem each year for a 10-year time span. So we coined this program, the Reimagining Cities Program, and over the next 10 years, we'll take on problems like food, jobs, waste, housing, transportation, entertainment. With the inspiration of the River Park, we decided to start our program around public space. We called the project the Town Square. And over the course of the last year, each of our offices researched their city, came up with a series of ideas, and tried to push one project forward. In Bangalore, they looked at their city and they saw 
the lakes that dotted the city as a tremendously neglected asset. Many of those lakes are polluted, neglected, ringed with chain fences. So our office proposed turning one lake into a lake square by working through the ecology and activating the edge of the lake in a way that's deeply rooted in Indian culture, they felt that they could connect the city to their water in a whole new way and create a tremendous asset for their community. New York, on the other hand, took a completely different look at their city. They looked around their city and they saw streets. And they saw a tremendous amount of wasted space in the city's streetscape. They actually analyzed the city and found over 5 million square feet of underutilized and unused space on the city's streetscapes. So in the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy, they decided to do a prototype on Allen Street that would not only provide community amenities in this streetscape, but also would test strategies around resiliency, strategies around waste disposal and biomass energy, around solar and renewable energy, and around stormwater retention. This linear park they thought could become a cycleway with bike racks and areas where they could have farmers markets and pop-up stores, areas for lounging and greenscapes. And lastly, I want to talk about, in right here in our own backyard, Pershing Square. Our office in LA is working with the Pershing Square Task Force to understand the opportunity to turn that blighted part of the city into a truly valuable asset. Over the last 150 years, Pershing Square has gone through an identity crisis and has been redesigned at least six times. It's gone from being what was essentially a green space to what is today an almost unusable hardscape, with over 80% of it covered with concrete. <clears throat> so how do you engage a community in a discussion about how to take advantage of a, a space like Pershing Square? Well, we developed a process that reached out to the community and challenged their preconceptions and solicited ideas, and we got 300 ideas about what people would like to see in that park. And I want to show you a short video clip about how we took those ideas and developed some analytical tools to turn that park into a design that we think starts to make sense. So first we started with understanding who the residents were. Who's nearby? What kind of work goes on nearby? What kind of living goes on nearby? Where are people coming from that go by the park? The residents, the employees, people who transit through there. We started to develop an understanding of the influences that impact that space. And we started to look at how pedestrians view the space as they walk by it and identified a pedestrian dominant area, and then how vehicles view it and identified a vehicle dominant area. We looked at how the sun affected it, because it impacts where you want hardscape and where you want softscape. Primarily areas in shade want hardscape, areas that are in sun can support vegetation. We looked at what activities the community wanted to see there and what the adjacencies and proximities should be between those activities. What activities wanted to be adjacent to each other, what activities it didn't matter, and what activities wanted to be far away from each other. Each program element, each activity, had a certain scale requirement to be able to support it. So we put all that in the computer, and all of these things were manipulated and optimized against one another. Sun exposure, landscape, transits and vehicles, and pedestrian exposure, where people were coming from, and aggregated it in a, an analysis that ultimately we modeled in the computer to be able to design 
the space. We looked at the terrain and the grade and what kind of activities wanted certain kinds of grade. So ultimately, we believe that this asset can be an extraordinary, powerful, positive force in the middle of downtown Los Angeles. Today, it's, it's underutilized, but in the future, we think it can be something that activates a, an entire part of the downtown urban core. So what I want to do is I want to challenge you I want to challenge you to make sure that we design the world that we want. Each one of us has a responsibility to see the opportunities that are there, to look with fresh eyes and see what's possible, to take risks and do things that we haven't seen before and challenge our, our assumptions, and to get engaged and make sure that we overcome obstacles to move things forward. I want to tell you in closing, of, about a story about two people who had an impact on the largest city in America, New York City. These aren't architects or designers or planners. These are just residents of a neighborhood that's blighted. The project is the High Line. The High Line is a project that many of you know and a lot of TED Talks have been given on, but what they don't talk about is who started the process. Two gentlemen, Joshua David and Robert Hammond, in 1999, saw an opportunity. They took a risk and they got engaged. They created a not-for-profit, the Friends of the High Line, that was an advocate for taking what was an abandoned railway line and turning it into a public asset. They started in 1999 and it took them five years to convince the city to, to commit the funds to build the High Line, and then it took another seven years for it to actually get completed. So a total of 12 years of commitment to making a huge change that has been the catalyst for the revitalization of a whole district in the city and has been a draw to New York City from around the world. You know, the American dream is all about making cities, making our future better for our children. And I want you to know that each one of you have the power to make cities better. I want to challenge you that in our haste to respond to the forces of population growth that are going to make us build these cities, that they become the cities we want them to be. Thank you very much.